So, that was 2020. Then we ended up in 2021. And I actually got a good use out of Twitter. This actually happened in July 2020, so we were still all sort of staying, staying on for the most part, wondering when we could emerge. But then, actually, in this class previously, I have assigned this book, The Emperor of All Maladies. It's a very thick book, but it's a biography of cancer. And it really does earn that name. It's a really cool interdisciplinary story. I learned a lot from it, even though I worked in the Cancer Research Center, right? And I really like how Mukherjee writes. In fact, he said, call me Sid. So I think I will call him Sid because he told me that. Because he was on Twitter and he was said, could somebody please, he was thinking about this, and is there a homology map of the beta coronaviruses that have been circulating in human populations? And I saw this, let's see, how fast did it take me to respond? I can't see because I cut off the time thing. But he was wondering if there was some kind of cross the community because he saw the 60% figure as well. And so I was like, well, why not? I'll say that I have it. And I, I presented it, the research project. You know, so I talked about it online. And I, I did my little colored things uh, that I made up the table with the red and green. And uh, yeah, I said the, the boxes are around that. So and you can see there's lots of boxes. So there's lots of cross reactivity. And then he was like, one thing led to another. And then he actually interviewed me. Now, this is a long time. Of, he interviewed me like in December. And then this article came out in February 22. And the whole thing was he interviewed me about this idea that cross reactivity could be somehow protective. Because as you can tell from his name, his family is from India. And he um, was noticing that in 2020, India was not hit that hard by the virus. In fact, some people were saying they were locking down too hard because their population was going to catch it anyway. And there were not that many people being sick, um, you know. So it was one of those things, and it was a very big question in 2020. Um, and he talked also about sub-Saharan Africa, where the same sort of thing had been seen. I remember people being worried about about India, about sub-Saharan Africa in particular, because they don't have the medical facilities that we do. So on the other hand, I looked at the age profile of COVID, I looked at the demographics, and I thought about ventilation. And I said, well, we have to see. In 2020, they had not been hit as hard. And so this is my, where I was actually quoted in the New Yorker by Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Mukherjee. And um, yeah, it, it, he talked about the project. And I said that you can do it in your kitchen. So I mean, you can do it in any room. But if you say kitchen, that is the closest room to a lot of activity. But um, look for fragments in my share. And the whole thing is that they have a significant number of shared fragments. It's not peer-reviewed science, but it's an interview, and it was probably the most prominent thing I've ever been quoted in. Now, I uh, gave a version of this talk in 2021, and I said, um, I remember one year ago, that it was really, uh, it was a pretty dark time. We didn't know what was going on. And so I posted that, and I, I posted that again. But you see how I say here, I still have plenty of worries. And my first worry is India. Because, of course, I kept watching the numbers, and I was seeing India was going up. So right after I had this whole thing about, oh, this could be the reason why India is not as infected as other countries, then India starts getting infected. And so I'm a little bit like, oh, boy, just sit up and want to talk to me again, you know, things like that. And uh, um, I, I hope that, um, that like, this is not going to be some devastating part of the plague that's going to take over the world. And it was sort of between the two extremes. Because as you know now, the Delta variant was emerging in India and then spread across the world. And this is what I did not expect. Of course, my entire thing was based on the original part of SARS, and we didn't know how fast it was going to evolve. Um, there's good news, bad news. The good news is that it evolved at the common rate of coronaviruses, but then it surprised us. So when I talked, everything that I talked was completely, I don't know what I would have done differently. Um, and I also said that I don't know how much it's going to mutate in the future. And, you know, in the article, Sid, also, it's weird to call him that, but uh, he said that it was, um, that he had lots of we don't know in it. So I think that, I don't know if he's embarrassed with the article now, given what happened, but I don't think he should be. I think this article came out here. And you see how good it looked in India here. This is hospitalizations and ICU admissions. And then, Basically, the hospitals got maxed out when Delta hit. And it was uh, the point to where it's still hard for us to know exactly 
how bad it went on. You know, the positivity rate here is really huge. It's all the way up to 40% at one point. And so it happened in April and May, thankfully after the New Yorker was recycled in most people's homes. But um, it, was a, it was actually, a, it was surprising to pretty much everyone uh, that how severe the Indus wave was. So this is from the, um, the science article, or yeah, this is science, that talks about the sort of uh, looking back on it, taking it apart. What made Delta so much worse? And there's two possibilities. And they're hard to tell apart, by the way. Was it escaping immunity more? Or was it transmitting more? Or transmitting more? And you see right here, you, because you can't tangle them apart, you've got to sort of take a guess and run several simulations. But they ended up thinking that there was a about a 1.5 to two-fold greater transmissibility and about a 20% reduction in the immune response, about 20% immune escape. So it looks like more transmissibility than immune escape. Okay. Um, there's several ways to get at this, and my main way is we're not quite sure. But I like how this graph gets across that we aren't quite sure. But it certainly doesn't look like it's mostly immune escaping. It's mostly transmitting one. And in fact, we even have molecular mechanisms and stuff like that now. And now we have, um, the, this is uh, done by other methods. This is from Trevor Bedford's laboratory, and he is one of the best voices on virology to listen to. He's over in Fair Hutch. And he talks about, um, he uses genetic techniques. So as opposed to using the sort of epidemiological uh, techniques, what he does is based on viral sequences in a very deep way. And he looks at the spread, and he looks at the pattern of spread, but he, he does it differently than the paper does. And yet, that for Delta, they come up with about a two-fold transmission advantage, just like for the other phase. And notice also how all these other variants, and I remember when Alpha came out, and everyone was worried it was going to be um, terrible, and then it was basically bad in Michigan. These things are weird, and they're local, and we don't quite know what's going on. Beta, Gamma, Epsilon, most people don't remember that we had so many variants because we just focused on the ones that really broke out. Most of these variants were way down here as far as transmissibility, closer to one than to two. But Delta is different. Delta is just a step forward. Here is a third way to look at it, which just came out, and this is from post Omicron. So this is actually data collected January 20th of this year. And they basically estimated the R value. Now this, I don't believe this is the true R value, because again, it combines the immune escape with transmissibility. You can't just say it's transmissibility, and it's because it's a background that's also changing. So I don't believe that Omicron's R value is actually all the way up to eight. I don't think that that's a meaningful calculation. Yet we can say it's higher, and we can say it's substantially higher. So don't pay attention to the numbers on the axis, but do pay attention to the differences. So we have the original strain in gray, and these are the, the ways of the different distinguishable strains. How many people do they infect? And if you look at this, as you go through time, there's basically three steps up, where you have a step up and you have a big bubble. And you have the alpha step up, you have the delta step up, here's delta, and up here is the Omicron step up. All the other variants basically fall to the same transmissibility, at least, the same R value. So it looks like, as far as genuine stuff that happens, I was operating, I did my research here, I um, did my interview here, where we were seeing alpha come through, but alpha wasn't that much different. So I was convinced that the line would continue like this, right? So I gave my interview here, and then the virus moved up like that. Um, the reason why it moved up is a lot of uh, speculation that we can talk about. But the fact is that it did move up. And this is what surprised me. I didn't think it would do this. I thought it would probably go like this at worst. So um, this early jump is it, and then Omicron comes out, which surprises me even more. I mean, Delta, I sort of could have anticipated as sort of a, um, a, a surprising scenario. Omicron, I would not have anticipated. There's other things that ways that you can look at it. Trevor Bedford talks about the emergence of the variants. They always start in a particular place, 
So like alpha started in the UK. Beta, which you haven't heard much about here, but they caused a whole wave in South Africa. Beta caused a wave there. And I think it's interesting too to look to see where these things move around. Because I know there was an alpha wave in Michigan, is where I presented one of the talks. I flew into the alpha wave and I'm like, this vaccine better work because I'm flying right into a wave of, of a virus. And I was okay, it's broke down. So, um, but the thing is, you can see Trevor Bedford actually has his ways of looking at the number of mutations over time, time on the x axis, mutations on the y axis. It's very simple. And you can see they branch out like a tree. And this is where the alpha emerges, and you get a lot more. And there's sort of this jump, because that's what it takes to establish a new strain. But it's only a jump of about, you know, five, six, maybe ten mutations from the other ones. That's all you need to do a normal jump. And so this is the case when Delta was overtaking the world. And if you remember, we were in the middle of the Delta wave in fall 2021. And there was a question of, is, um, even when Omicron came out, there was a question of, will it actually displace Delta? Or can you catch both of them? And if you catch Delta, could you catch Omicron? We didn't know for sure, but was after looking at the data, it looked like Omicron did displace Delta. This is what it looks like on Trevor Bedford's website. You can see the Delta is the green that's coming on. You can see the Alpha, here's the Alpha wave right here. The beta wave is somewhere down there. If you look at it, it's the, the blue, it's hard to find. And all the other, um, all the other things. Just remember, there are lots of variants that never catch on, and that's another thing that sort of gives me a little bit of hope, even when I'm surprised by one like Delta. Here's how they all look, and I just want to do this again to say, okay, alpha expected, beta, gamma, delta, whoa, what's going on there? And then Omicron is whiplash. It's, it's completely in another direction genomically, and there it is going off there. Um, I wonder what's happening with severity. I can see that severity might be related in all these, but then Omicron comes out, which is much more highly immunoscaping, and either ran into a trade-off where it had to get less severe, or we have the coin flip, and um, we, after flipping the coin, it landed heads with Delta and ended up being more severe. It landed tails with Omicron and ended up being less severe. Um, we don't really know yet, but we can try to figure out these things by looking at the trees. The one thing that shows is that Omicron is different than Delta in a different way. It's not just different, it's different in a different way. And you can see that on this as well. When Omicron came on, it appeared here, and it filled up, and the good news is it displaced Delta. The good news is this Packard ratio for hospitalization, you see how much lower it is than all the other ones. So it was very transmissible, it actually ended up being a good thing because it ended up, um, keeping people out of the hospital and training their immune systems to see the whole virus when before maybe they had just seen the vaccine. So you can see that Delta was actually more severe. Here's Alpha and Beta and Gamma. They just didn't go around enough um, to begin this country for me to see the data from them. And uh, Delta was more severe than Alpha or than the original COVID. So the question is, how unusual is this? How unusual is the fact that Omicron? I look at this, and I think it could fit with the coin flip. Coin flip, it gets worse. You know, heads it gets worse, tails it gets better, as far as severity. And so, in a sense, we maybe uh, the coin flip is one way for Delta and another way for Omicron. I'm not sure about that, but at least this looks like 50 percent are worse and 50 percent are better or the same. So that is most of the talk about the variants, but now I want to switch to a different kind of data. And this is where I want to actually switch.